January of 1959, the village of Yakushinsi of Vinitsa region. One morning, a neighbor stepped into the yard of the Jichenko's house. Nobody opened the door, she knocked. Smelling the burning hay, the woman went to the barnyard where she saw Viktor Jichenko's dead body. A murder from a firearm was a rather rare crime in late 50s. Only hunters were allowed to keep rifles at home. All the guns were strictly controlled and accounted for. In the evening, a neighbor heard a shot and thought that Victor was shooting hares, even though hunting within settlement limits was prohibited. In the morning, she went to reprimand him. The local policeman characterized the victim as a rude man prone to conflict. He could have easily had a fight with someone and resorted to shooting. He didn't know why his wife was not at home. Maybe she freaked out and ran away. A forensic examination established that the shooter used buckshot. Half of the victim's skull was destroyed. Detectives found a shell. Another find was a Mayak branded matchbox on which a woman wearing an Uzbek national costume was drawn. Possibly, the haystack was put on fire using these matches. Detectives carefully examined the matchbox. There were several dozen matches producers in the USSR distributing the production locally. Mayak factory, based in the remote city of Rybinsk, would not ship its output to Vinitsa region. Not far from the crime scene, a criminalist found tire prints left by a motorcycle with a sidecar. The neighbor was not sure if she really heard the noise of a motorcycle engine. Meanwhile, another neighbor arrived at the crime scene, who turned out to witness the fire on the victim's plot. The man told that last evening he saw a haystack burning in Victor's barnyard. He rushed to alert Victor, banged at his door until he opened up. Victor dashed out to put out the fire, swearing at all and telling his wife Ludmila to grab a rifle. Getting outside, the neighbor heard a gunshot. He thought that it was a salt charge, not a regular cartridge. Victor always kept several salt charged cartridges without posing any threat to life. They caused unbearable pain. In the fall, it was an effective way to scare off local boys venturing to steal apples in his orchard. The rifle was never found. Victor's and Ludmila's life was not a bed of roses. He used to regularly beat her up. Thus, she had a good motive to shoot him, and she was the one to go grab the rifle too. The first and rather simple hypothesis of a domestic conflict appeared. Finding Ludmila became imperative. The neighbor suggested that she was most likely to hide at her sister's place in Vinitsa. The detective found Ludmila's sister and her husband at home. Valentina swore that her sister did not come over at night. The news about Victor's death shocked the family. Yuri was his nephew, and it was Victor who introduced them to each other, which made the family bonds double tight. Last time they visited relatives, two weeks ago. They planned another visit for this weekend, but had to cancel. Yuri's lupus got aggravated, covering his face with rash. They both claimed that Ludmila could not have guts to murder her husband. Yuri recalled that some suspicious man could come to see Victor. Some of them delivered money, others collected cash from him. Those guys seemed to fit for the murder for abducting Ludmila and extorting money. A man murdered in the village of Yakushinsi. The weapon of murder is supposedly his own rifle. He had run out of his house to put out the burning haystack and sent his wife to grab the rifle. The wife becomes a prime suspect as she vanishes from the crime scene. Police are focused on the tire prints left by a motorcycle with a sidecar and a matchbox. Ludmila's sister's apartment keeps no traces of the suspects being there. Detectives did not rule out that the motorcycle and matches were in no way connected to the tragic event. It was impossible to establish when the tire print was left and how long the matchbox had sat on the floor. However, an idea that the haystack was put on fire to lure Victor out of his house seemed plausible. Detectives' pondering was interrupted by a phone call. The traffic patrol reported that an overthrown motorcycle with a sidecar was found on the outskirt of Vananovice village. It was a truck driver who noticed it. He was passing by, pulled over, came to the motorcycle, and noticed a woman lying in the snow. She was alive, though unconscious, with a massive wound on her head spilled with drying blood. 
The driver carried the victim to his truck cab, brought her to the hospital, and reported finding a motorcycle to the police. A detective arrived at the hospital. He asked Ludmila's sister to join for identification, but was cautious enough to let her into the ward at once. The doctor said that the patient cannot be questioned. Due to a serious head injury, she has not come to. Describing the injury, the doctor assumed that it was unlikely to have been caused by a vehicle accident. He could not find many bruises and fractures. It rather looked like a blow stricken by somebody. Valentina identified her sister at once. She was allowed to stay in the ward. The motorcycle license plates helped quickly establish its owner. When the detective arrived to Sergei Rebekon, another Yakushinsi villager, it turned out that the man was on his way to the police to report the missing vehicle. He had been out of the village for a week, visiting with his Kiev relatives, and upon return he found the padlock on his garage broken. Sergei was sure he knew the name of the stealer. It is a local thug, Grigory Kazulka, who was many times caught breaking into villagers' houses and sheds. No answer came to knocking at Grigory's door, but the laundry drying at his backyard was still wet, meaning that the clothes were washed recently. Some noise came from inside the house and the detective decided to enter without an invitation. The house owner jumped out of the window, yet his escape attempt failed. The man was charged with resisting the detention, stealth of the vehicle and robbery assault on the Jechenkas. Grigori, baffled with these charges, started to yell he had no connection to these events whatsoever. More so, he had an alibi for the time of Victor's killing. He was drinking beer with his pals at home, leaving nowhere. The detective noticed a collection of matchboxes in a cupboard, including a matchbox identical to the one found on the crime scene. Same Mayak brand, same Uzbek costume girl on a label. Given how well the crime was thought out, Grigori was unlikely to use matches from his collection to put the haystack on fire. The men explained that the collection belonged to his brother, Vasily, who fusses over each matchbox, and Grigori would not dare to touch any of them. Salt, soap, and matches, three items that were an absolute must-have to withstand war, occupation, siege, or epidemics. As soon as the public started to fear some trouble, these three items would be the first to disappear from shops. While planning matches production, the timber industry always bore in mind that the demand for them was always above normal. People would usually stock matches for future use, eagerly accept match boxes instead of small change. Starting from early 1950s, Mayak factory started to post original labels on their products, which made them a valuable collectible both within and outside of the USSR. This motivated the factory to start manufacturing matchbox sets skewed by the same theme. Sport, national costumes, fine art, animals. Such sets were featured at Brussels Expo 58 exhibition in the section of Soviet design and caused a lot of interest. Detectives showed Grigori the protocols of his previous detentions featuring a broad span of offenses from stealing neighbors' rabbits all the way to an attempt to hijack a motorcycle. No case made it to the courtroom, however. Brother Vasily settled down all the claims. One of the protocols contained Grigori's confession that he could start a motorcycle without a key by crossing wires. He did start a machine but did not manage to leave. The owner caught him red-handed. The suspect went to detention and detective decided to talk to his brother Vasily, who owned the matchbox collection. Vasily was at home. He confirmed that the collection belonged to him, but he was hiding it from his wife. She hates his spending too much money for his hobby. Detectives wondered about the origin of the box with the Uzbek costume girl and whether it was a unique one in the collection. Vasily said he had several of a kind and all of them were a present from his uncle residing in Yaroslav and visiting them in Vinitsa some time ago. Vasily left one box in his collection and took the rest to work where he had fellow collectors to trade or even to give away some of them. Vasily could not imagine that whoever of his fellow collectors could shoot a man from a firearm. And none of them would definitely set fire with a precious collectible match. It could only be done by someone who has no idea about the match's value. Vasily recalled that once he presented this matchbox to his workmate. 
He left the matchbox unattended, and a mechanic struck a match out of it to light his cigarette. A trace left by striking a match on the side devalues the box. When the mechanic realized his flop, he apologized and promised to compensate the spoiled box with some other one. Vasily works at a canned food factory. The mechanic's name is Yuri. Detectives recalled their conversation with Valentina and her husband Yuri, who mentioned working at a canned food factory. Vasily identified the mechanic in a photo shown to him. He also added that the guy knows his brother Grigori, as he had introduced them to each other. Detectives were contemplating a new assumption. What if Yuri, the victim's nephew, is a murderer? Detectives brought up the neighbor's testimony, whereby Victor rushed out of the house, followed by Ludmila. The neighbor walked out of the wicket and heard the shot. The distance to the wicket is just 10 steps, which he covered in the most of 30 seconds. This time was definitely not enough for Ludmila to bring a rifle. What if she did not get it? What if the rifle was not in by that time? Only someone close to the family could steal it. A nephew most certainly qualifies. A shot of buckshot fired from a hunting rifle kills a man in the village of Yakushinsi. The murderer man's wife also falls victim of unknown perpetrators. She suffered a blow on her head and was left behind in a staged car accident involving a hijacked motorcycle. A suspected hijacker is Grigory Kazulka, having a record of multiple thefts, but offering a reliable alibi. Detectives focus attention on a matchbox's collection, whose owner claims that the box found at the crime scene could belong to Victor, the victim's nephew. Police presented suspicion to him as there were too many clues pointing at his participation in the crime. Yuri was nervous and his excuses did not sound credible enough. Like he ran out of matches from the Uzbek themed box long ago and he threw the empty box away. He also pledged he knew nothing about his uncle's rifle. He did admit that he was not in very good terms with uh, Victor. The uncle treated him squeamishly because of his lupus problem. He avoided close contacts and called the nephew red-faced. In the middle of interrogation, the news arrived. The probable murder weapon has been found. Walking in the woods, one of the locals stumbled over a rifle wrapped in some cloth. The chances to find fingerprints on the rifle are high enough. The detective warned after the fingerprints get identified, Yuri will no longer be able to hope for the full confession. The suspect was left with no choice to admitting that he was the one who killed Viktor Dechenko. The reason for the murder sounded extraordinarily. Viktor would insult and humiliate his nephew over his disease. He embarrassed Yuri publicly, accentuating his squeamishness to the rash on the face. This argumentation of the crime was hard to believe, but Yuri's story was quite convincing. He told how he stole the rifle beforehand how he put a haystack on fire, luring Victor out. He also told that right after shooting, he ran to the woods, dumped the rifle there, and returned to Vinitsa. He said he knew nothing about the motorcycle and did not see Ludmila, his wife's sister. Suddenly, the hospital reported that the victim's wife, Ludmila, came to. Next to her in the ward was her sister, Valentina. She was crying and passionately saying something to the patient. Once the detective showed up, she went mute. She was asked to leave. Expectations to have an open conversation with Ludmila did not come true. She said she remembered nothing and was unable to keep talking, complaining on unbearable headache. Hopefully, Valentina might shed some light on the situation. The detective told that her husband was apprehended and confessed in the killing of his uncle. Valentina pretended she knew nothing about it. Her behavior prompted an opposite conclusion, though. The detective called her an accessory to murder and charged her with an attempt to kill her sister. Valentina fainted, and while she was unconscious, the doctor assumed she was pregnant. The woman came to and said that there was nothing that threatened her sister. Her husband and she put her on the roadside to make sure that the first bypassing driver would notice her and take her to the hospital. The hijacked motorcycle remained a missing link in this puzzle. At another interrogation, Grigori swore he knew nothing about the plotted murder. Yuri just asked him to hijack the bike and paid him for that. He said the motorcycle would be gone just for one night. 
On returning the next morning, Grigori planned to return it to the garage so that the owner would not even know. In the morning, however, Yuri did not return the bike. He explained that the engine died and he had to leave the machine in the middle of the road. Grigori was ready to answer for stealing the vehicle, but not for the murder. The detective showed Valentina the fingerprints, examination results proving that the prints on the rifle belonged to Yuri. Alongside that, prints on the handguard and the trigger were left by Valentina. It looked like Yuri tried to take all the blame, but the fact remained obvious. It was Valentina who fired at Victor. The woman finally admitted and started to testify. It all began on that unfortunate day when she came to visit her sister, but did not find her at home. Victor said Ludmila had left to sell stuff at the market and would stay in the nearby town overnight to return home next morning. He offered Valentina a drink and after a few shots went on to molest her. Valentina tried to fight off, but it only stirred up his excitement. A weak woman fell victim of brutal violence. Valentina did not report the rape because it was too embarrassing to go through. Besides, she did not know how she'd look in her sister's eyes. A month later, she came again. Victor's nephew was visiting with his uncle at a time. Valentina told she was pregnant and sought advice. Victor introduced her to Yuri, who liked her a lot, and soon moved in. He got a job at the canned food factory. They decided to get married. Valentina confessed she was expecting a baby on the ninth week of her pregnancy. Yuri got very excited, projecting happy future. Valentina realized she could not and did not want to be a cheater, and one day she shared the truth with Yuri. It came as a real shock to him. To save their relations, desperate Valentina was ready to call a doctor to rid her of the baby. Yuri was against it. Then Valentina admitted she wanted to take revenge on Victor. His death will be a retribution for his crime and will free her sister from the tyrant husband. Yuri had his own reasons for the revenge. Victor ousted him and his mother out of his house, demanded unreserved obedience, and enjoyed seeing people fearing him. Yuri stole his uncle's rifle two weeks before the murder. Victor only went hunting in the summer, which is why he did not even notice the missing weapon. Yuri was devoted to shoot the offender, but Valentina said she would do it herself. She really craved seeing horror in Victor's eyes before he died. The couple set a haystack on fire and waited for Victor. Valentina pointed the rifle at him. Victor begged for mercy, apologized, and was even ready to kneel. Nevertheless, Valentina fired. She was taking it out on the dead body, but Yuri moved her away and told her to run to the motorcycle. On the way, they bumped into Ludmila, who saw Yuri holding a rifle. The young man stunned her with a rifle and took her to the motorcycle. They hoped that after the sister comes to, they would explain everything. The blow turned out to be too heavy, though. Ludmila could not come to. Taking Ludmila to the hospital was not an option either. It would expose them at once. They chose to take her to their place. Next morning, they staged the accident putting Ludmila on the roadside so that she could be seen and waited until she was picked up. Detectives were baffled. During their visit to Valentina and Yuri, the unresponsive woman was lying in the next room. The court sentenced Valentina to 10 years in prison. Yuri's punishment was nine years. Staying behind bars, Valentina gave birth to a daughter. While the woman was serving her time, her sister assumed guardianship of the little girl.